Right, so we've gone from the 1960s to literally right up to, uh, to date. And uh, Patrick Henningsen has become you know, a regular AV speaker, and as his presentations are always, 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 are always, absolutely current. Remember two years ago, two years ago he uh, gave us a presentation from his first-hand experiences out at the Bundy Ranch in Arizona. And last year, um, actually I'm going to jump to Vanessa Beely because we had Vanessa Beely talking to us about Syria, her experiences of Syria, and the White Helmets. And there is no question that Vanessa's work and the exposure that she's been given both from AV but then also on UK Column was certainly instrumental in getting the Nobel Prize to the White Helmets shut down. Yeah. And, and pretty much your first clue as to whether somebody is actually doing any genuine research or simply regurgitating what they are uh, being fed by the lamestream media is to ask them their stance on the white helmets. And that will give you an instant insight into where they sit. Well, Patrick has uh, been teaming up with Vanessa. He has been in Syria for the past five weeks. Uh, he has been, I think, broadcasting live radio every day from Syria. From for the last uh, five weeks, been yep. giving regular updates on UK Column uh, with Vanessa. Vanessa's now uh, back in France, and uh, Patrick landed back on Thursday, took a quick trip down to Plymouth, and I think you're going to be uh, spending a bit of time in the UK now, because Patrick's about to embark on doing a doctorate? Uh, m m uh, postgraduate. Postgraduate in international relations. But uh, Patrick is a genuine 21st century wire, <laughs> 21st century journalist, genuine journalist, doesn't cut and paste, actually goes out. <laughs> goes out to the front line to get the information directly. He's what a journalist should be. What journalists were up until perhaps about 25, 30 years ago. And sadly, you know, obviously they are now a shadow. So thankfully we have people like Patrick who continue on the great tradition of genuine journalism. And I know he's going to be uh, keeping you absolutely spellbound with his revelations from Syria. So it's my great pleasure. Patrick Henningsen. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you, and uh, thanks everybody. Amazing turnout this year, and uh, I knew I knew it was a great year, Ian, because when I arrived and checked into my hotel room, I had a queen size bed, <laughs> and I thought I've I've arrived, really. So, thank you for that. Um, I just before we get started, you know, Ian introduced me. He says I'm a journalist. It's almost like it's almost like that word the profession has been given a bad name in recent years. So I'm almost reticent even to, to use the term. If, if I show you my press card, I actually, I'm an accredited <coughs> journalist, but on my press card it says writer. And so when they ask me what I'm doing, what do I do, I say I'm a writer. I don't say I'm a journalist because it's almost like it's got a bad connotation to it. And uh, <laughs> we only have our friends at uh, CNN and the BBC, and now The Guardian, to thank for that sad state of affairs. But anyway, let's get started. So when Ian contacted me to do this talk, he said, you know, what are we going to do? We talked about a few ideas. And at the time when he, uh, when he was organizing this, in uh, December, fake news was the rage. That was, this was the big theme in the news. So I sort of fashioned my talk, my presentation around this idea of fake news. And our website, myself as well, as an individual, has been put front and center 
in that debate uh, by a number of mainstream media outlets and institutions. And so, but then I did this trip, uh, which I just got back from, and I went to Syria with Vanessa Beely and spent uh, over a month there. And so I've got a two-part presentation. I'll, I'm going to give you what I think is the genealogy of fake news. And I want to impress on everybody that the biggest purveyors of fake news are the corporate mainstream media and organizations uh, like those. So I'm going to show you that. I'm going to prove it. I'm also going to show you what the real problem is. We're going to get to the heart of the problem. And you know, we're all part of this. We're all part of the problem, but also we're all part of the solution, too. So I want to map this out for you. And then I'm going to show you, I cut that presentation short, and I'm going to show you some uh, images and some footage that I haven't shown anybody yet from Syria. And I'm going to show you images that nobody in the West, so you'll be the first to see some of this stuff. And I tell you, you haven't ever seen it in the mainstream media. So fake news. The fir first thing to impress upon everybody, this is not a new problem. OK, let's go all the way back to 1938. 1938, and there was a broadcaster, a young, ambitious lad for CBS radio by the name of Orson Welles. And he did a broadcast which became, uh, it was the first big sort of hoax or fake news event. And it was the War of the Worlds broadcast on CBS radio. And this was the mainstream media reaction to this. I'm going to just play a little bit of the original broadcast so you can just get a little feel for it here. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. <laughs> Jersey, warning, poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes, reaches South Street, gas masks useless, urge population to move into open spaces, automobiles use routes 7, 23, 24, avoid congested areas, smoke now spreading over, over Raymond Boulevard. Okay, let me uh, just impress upon everybody what I was taught about this event. What I was taught was that when this, when this broadcast went on the air, people lost their minds. It was pandemonium, chaos in the street. This is the, this is the version of history I was taught in school in the United States about this broadcast. But when you do some research about it, so you've got the New York Daily News. So back in 1938, the, the newspapers, the broadsheets, that was the establishment corporate mainstream media. Radio was an emerging maverick media platform. Does this sound familiar? OK. So what the mainstream media did was create loads of headlines across America saying, pandemonium in the streets, you know, uh, civil unrest, all because of this uh, radio show and this irresponsible medium of communication, which is radio and how it needs to, it's, it's not fit for public consumption, it doesn't have all the pedigree that print has, okay? So, it, so they ran this fake news campaign about a fake news story. It's very sophisticated what happened. The reason is because advertisers were migrating to radio because they could buy slots for cheaper and, and hit a bigger audience. And they found the retention and the customer loyalty on radio advertising was much higher than on print. And the budgets were more affordable. So a small to medium-sized business in a local area could get into a radio advertising package, but not into the big newspapers, which was really reserved for big automotive manufacturers, cosmetic companies, and things like this. So they tried to de demonize radio. In the same way, we see the same thing happening today with the internet. And so this fake news crisis, in my opinion, and I, I believe this is fact. It's a fake crisis created to marginalize uh, s s certain social media platforms and internet platforms as a sort of go-to destination for 
uh, breaking news and information. Okay, so William Randolph Hearst, Joseph Pulitzer, they created wars back, you know, 120 years ago. And before that, we had Horace Greeley, who helped to pump up the Civil War in the United States by pushing fake news in newspapers. And so today, the same exact thing we have with the, with the Murdoch press pushing the war, first Gulf War, second Gulf War, Libya, Yugoslavia, Syria, Yemen, and the list goes on and on. You can add a bunch of things in there, the Falklands, whatever you want. Okay, it's the same problem. So the biggest problem, the, the big ticket fake news item is war. And everyone needs to, you all know that, <laughs> obviously, but you need to impress that upon your friends and your colleagues and people when you're having this discussion about this problem called fake news. Because the ramifications of this, these events are much greater than any election, okay? Because real people die in war, and it's a business. And that's what the mainstream media, that's what they do. And, and you can go back even further to the beginning of the printing press. And uh, Alex Thompson from the UK column wrote a great op-ed for us and took this right back to the beginning of British politics and the War of the Roses. That's how old fake news and press control goes. You can go all the way back that far, maybe farther. So it's all up on, uh, on our website. So, so this is how it all got started, okay? Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, the talking point came, this, we've got to do something about this fake news problem. And, f and there are all these stories flooding on Facebook, fake uh, Hillary stories and so forth, and this was one of the reasons, along with Russian hacking and et cetera, that, that Hillary Clinton lost the election, so the establishment media says. So we, we came out pretty early and said, it's a hoax. And there's, they still haven't, it's, it's, it's dying a death right now, the whole Russian hack thing. So because people like us and other good independent outlets took this stance, we became a target. And me particularly, individually became a target because of that. It has nothing to do with fake news. And I challenged, I'll show you in a minute. So I woke up one morning to find out we're featured in the LA Times, which is one of the major newspapers in the US. And I was getting emails from everybody, you're in this fake news list. So because we're, because we have a number in our name, to, to 21st century, we're always at the top of every list, unfortunately, um, every alphabetical list. But so we're in there, and this is uh, an academic from Massachusetts named uh, Dr. Melissa Zimdars in Media Studies. And so she's put together this list for her students as a guide of which websites are fake and which ones are conspiracy and which ones are uh, clickbait. And so she circulated this to her students and then they got picked up by the national press and now she's an expert on all the networks about fake news. And Activist Post is on there. I think even Robert Perry's Consortium News and uh, Paul Craig Roberts and you know some really good independent people have been included on this hit list, okay? Along with some really dodgy websites. So, and The Onion, which is a satire site. So what they're doing is trying to frame people like us and people like the UK Column and other independent voices who don't, aren't aligned with any particular government foreign policy to basically demonize us as fake news or Russian, uh, some sort of Russian uh, agents or something like this, as the Washington Post did. So she's got a PhD. Okay, so then NBC contacts me. This is the biggest investigative, this is like the news night or Panorama. This is the biggest invest, second biggest investigative program to 60 Minutes. So one of their producers emailed me and says, I'm reaching out to operators of websites that have been identified as sources of unconfirmed news stories. And I'd love to talk if you're available. And so I emailed her back and I said, to be completely honest with you, uh, my experience with media outlets like yours has been hostile, uh, including exchanges on this very subject with the LA Times, uh, who you're probably aware launched the fake news campaign. I'm sure you're doing your job and I appreciate you reaching out, but if this were a level playing field, I would love to have an honest discussion about the nature of media and challenges that you and I 
and everyone faces in the 21st century. Please know I'm not at all interested in being the subject of a hit piece. And then I offered her, you know, my time, and I said, what, if you want to talk, I never heard back from them after that, not surprisingly. So they were, <clears throat> they were kind of hovering over us, trying to throw some bait out, see if we'll bite. And the same thing, I had a similar exchange with the BBC indirectly through a third party, which was bizarre, uh, to, to come on and talk about MH17, because I had done an investigation on that. So they, they're constantly at it, basically. And so then, the University of Washington, I don't know if this is a government-funded study, I think it might be, uh, launched this study on analyzing fake news. And this is uh, Kate Starbird. So this is the University of Washington, great university, and they're getting grants to basically map out the alternative media. And who have they singled out uh, as the sort of, the, I was the only person named in this study, which was bizarre because I'm not the biggest alternative media outlet. But uh, so she said, um, the, the domain, my website, is owned by, and operated by Patrick Henningsen, a journalist who has worked for RT News, The Guardian, Global Research, and Infowars.com. I've, I've actually never worked for The Guardian. I've written for The Guardian, but never worked for them. And I don't get paid by RT, even though I've done a hun over 150 live segments with them. I don't get paid. So Global Research, I've never worked for. Uh, I write, I've, I've had stuff republished by them. Infowars, I did work for one year uh, in 2011. So, but the point is, this is a government, possibly a government funded study, high level academic study. They don't know what they're talking about, but they're, they're out to basically smear people who are out doing it really on a shoestring. And maybe because they're afraid of what we're putting out. Okay? And so she even sort of took the mickey out of our mission statement and uh, made fun of the fact that we are trying to empower our readers with critical thinking skills. This is a, like, supposedly a bad thing, according to the University of Washington. She says, examining the about page of 21st Century Wire, you can see how the site leverages and somewhat techno-utopian rhetoric of freedom in, of information and citizen journalism, explicitly encouraging readers to use their own critical thinking skills. How dare! <laughs> These are her words, okay? And she's Stanford educated. It's a top university in America. Skills while implicitly complimenting them. How dare you compliment bloggers for getting off their you-know-what to do some work. And uh, on those skills and perhaps activating a sense of confidence in their abilities. <laughs> Shame on you. You can handle this, he says. We'll give you the facts and you have to decide for yourself. Horrible. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. So the site also claims to be outside of both corporate and government control. They claim. They claim. The first claim represents somewhat of a natural counter positioning, i.e. alternative media against corporate mainstream media. But the second claim is somewhat disingenuous. As the domain often hosts content or cross posts stories from RT, formerly Russia Today, a media outlet funded largely and controlled by the Russian government. <laughs> so you can't repost or quote anything from RT because then you're under the control of Vladimir Putin. Okay, so this is what passes as high-level academic research in America right now, today, and she gets million-dollar grants, okay? Mil she's, had m she's had these sort of grants in the past. I don't know what this project was, but it was a total waste of money. That's our mission statement. You can go on our website and read it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. In fact, I think it's pretty good. But it's, it's, we've always been about getting people to be active themselves and trying to take some responsibility for the information. And so we're getting targeted and put on fake news lists on Google, on plugins, browser plugins, we're in there as well. So this is what's, it's, war, it's all out war. This is the information war, okay? So actual fake news. So let's look, this was during the election this is on um, the Facebook group system. This is where a lot of this stuff was circulating. This is 
a bogus story. There's hundreds of websites, many of them registered in, uh, in Macedonia, and a lot of them in the United States, pushing out this kind of fake pro-Trump stories that really look like they're designed, a lot of them, not just to make Hillary look bad or Islamophobic, but to make Trump look stupid or his supporters look stupid. And bot comments galore. You can just see them as soon as these are posted. So I've complained so much to Facebook. I wasted so much time protesting to Facebook saying, these are real fake news stories and why are you throttling my ability to share content on, on Facebook? Here's another one. Michelle Obama vows to confiscate all firearms before leaving. So people share this stuff. Here's another one. U.S. military preparing large scale for civil unrest. Okay. These are real ridiculous stories. But people, these are more popular and, and usually get higher metrics on shares and uh, likes than real news stories because this is the nature of people. And we even share stuff that we know is not true because we're, it's, it's, we've been doing it since we're kids. Hey, look at this. Hey, look at that. So the metrics don't mean a lot really on social media. So they tout these big metrics and how this was a big waterfall of disinformation during the election of Clinton and, and Trump. But in reality, it, it, it didn't, I don't know anybody in America who changed their vote for Hillary or Trump because of a fake news story on the internet. There's not, you'd be hard pressed to find one. So you can hardly call this a trend. But this was the talking point constantly. They're just banging on about it. So these are some of these some of these are well-known alternative media outlets. People post anything on Before It's News. It's, it's, a, it's an open platform, so if you don't know that, then you'll think that it's uh, something else. So here's one. Uh, Putin orders 100,000 troops with atomic weapons to prepare for NATO to go to CERN with backpack nukes, okay? That's a ridiculous story. But these things are so popular on social media, and I hate to say it, that website's making money hand over fist. Okay, real, real big money. Here's another one. This is a fake story. FBI insider, Clinton email linked to political pedophile sex ring. It's f factually not true. You can speculate about it, sure. It's possible, maybe. But there's actually no evidence for, for that. Okay, but this thing went mega viral. Okay, and the guy who owns that website is laughing all the way to the bank, and that's used to demonize bloggers and the alternative media. It's as simple as that. And the same with quite a few other things. I don't want to get into flat earth, but, um, but these sort of things are circulating like, like mad. So this is the Facebook solution. To put together a coalition of Google, Facebook, the New York Times, NBC, to police fake news on social media. It's called the First Draft Coalition Project Crosscheck. Okay? So they are gonna decide what's real and what's fake. And so they've put these little things now you see on Facebook, which is meaningless. I mean, anybody who doesn't like what you're posting, if it's about, if it's critical of Israel, for instance, you could get a whole, you could get a bot to say it's fake news and then Facebook will flag it and then you're out. So this is, the whole thing is ridiculous but I think it's also organized. So who's to blame? So they're saying that you're the, you're the problem, stupid people are the problem, alternative media is the problem, bloggers are the problem with of fake news, okay? So why is it that I can tell a fake story just by looking at it and someone working at Facebook can't, or someone at CNN can't, or theoretically there's millions of Americans who can't tell between what's real and what's fake. There is a degree of dumbing down in our society. People read headlines. They don't even click now. They see the headline, they comment. They hit like, that's my job done, off I go to the next one. We, we are doing this now with the smartphones. We're not actually engaging in the content because we're short on time and we're just trying to manage the waterfall of information or disinformation. So who's to blame? So who's to blame if, if the problem is a dumbing down of society, then who is, the, who is responsible for the dumbing down of society? Well, the Silicon Valley is partly responsible 
for the dumbing down of society. Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, Peter Thiel, Eric Schmidt, these guys are all partly responsible for the short attention span theater that is our society. The mainstream media is responsible for dumbing down the news and information. Hollywood is responsible for dumbing down the news. Walt Disney, and most people go to government schools, right? The majority of the population goes through the state education system. So, so who's, who's responsible for the dumbing down? Who's responsible for the fact that most people or many people can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not? It's not our fault. I'll put the, the blame at their feet, all of them. And, and they're getting together to police the problem now. Okay, that's where we're at. So Channel 4 did their fake news week. They announced this, and then, so we, we gazumped on top of them, and we did our fake news week and pushed them down on Google this year. We ran a fake news Final Four, as you can see, the uh, two brackets, and I think the CIA ended up edging out CNN in the end. And we ran polls as well, so thousands of people voted in that and engaged uh, in this situation here. So, and then we did the Horace Greeley Award, and our readers nominated some journalists. So you can see some familiar names on there from uh, CNN, the BBC, et cetera. And guess who won the Horace Greeley Award? This is the people's choice. Jon Snow. I don't know why. I have nothing to do with it. He was, he was nominated. And I think one of the things that got him the award was he ended up doing a, a hit interview on this MP from Aleppo, Farish Shahabi, and it was a brutal, brutal piece of television. Channel 4 is uh, giving the BBC a run for their money, if not surpass them already, okay? And so what they should be reporting is, so Ferris got a letter from ISIS saying, we own your factory now, when they took over East Aleppo and uh, you can buy it back from us, right? And so they destroyed thousands of factories in East Aleppo, these rebels. That should be the story. That's what Channel 4 should be spending their time and money on, but they're not. They're demonizing people who are suffering or people like this man who are trying to do something to defend his own country, okay? So fake news, fake narratives. So as far as Syria goes, peaceful uprising, freedom and democracy, civil war, moderate rebels, forces loyal to Assad, meaning the Syrian army. That'd be like British soldiers, forces loyal to Theresa May. You know, it's ridiculous, right? Forces loyal to Donald Trump, barrel bombs. These are all part of the fake narratives that have constructed and got people to accept a certain degree of military intervention or support for a proxy war in Syria. And the regime, when you hear this word, the regime, I, I even sometimes accidentally almost comes out of my mouth because it's just habit. The regime, Syrian regime. But that frames the whole narrative immediately. So there's the regime. Oxford educated, best British universities, two educated, civilized, erudite people have been demonized as murderers or mass murderers, killing their own people for sport. Okay, that's the narrative that we've been implanted on. So, how, so we've got a technically an unelected head of state or prime minister, unelected. So is that not a regime or does she have a mandate? Does she have more than 50%? He has 85%, right? How much does she have? And this guy, how, what's his mandate? Below 50%? So the Trump regime, it's, it's equally or more, it's more fitting for these two than it is for that man, okay? That's, that's a f statement of fact, in my opinion. Well, it <laughs> can't be a fact if it's my, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, so that's 2009. That's John Kerry having dinner with Bashar al-Assad and, and their wives. And I, I sat in this restaurant 
which is empty right now because of the war, one of the best restaurants in old city of Damascus. And Carrie sat there, smiled, and they toasted, and they stabbed that country in the back two years later, if, if not already preparing to do it as they, as they had their starters. Okay, amazing. But it's a media war. So I'll just show you some of the clips here just to give you a little taste. This is CNN's Clarissa Ward. Έχω πάει στη Συρία πάνω από 10 φορέ από την έναρξη του εμφυλίου και πολλέ φορέ πριν από αυτή. Αυτό που με εκπλήσει είναι πω κάθε φορά που βρίσκεσαι εκεί, πιστεύει πω δεν μπορεί να γίνει χειρότερη κατάσταση. Αυτό το κτίριο χτυπήθηκε. Παλούν το διπλό κάνω η κατάσταση. Nice shot. Good, isn't it? Is it real? Debatable. This is my favorite. What do you think? Does anybody work as an EMT? Work in medical? What, what exactly is the injury? Is it, is it a head injury? Because I don't see any blood coming from the head. Okay, this is a CNN special. This is what they do. So, so she's running around, and this is her fixer. His name is Bilal Abdul Karim. He's an American journalist who is with Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra. So let's see uh, what Bilal has to say. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I am Bilal Abdul Kareem, and the fighters are now preparing to leave the city of Aleppo. Now, if you can get a little bit closer here, and you will see what this is. This is an explosive belt, and as you can see, this is what he's wearing. This is what a lot of the fighters are wearing. Why? Because. Where do you think that guy with the mask is from, by the way? He, he, he definitely is not Arab, I can tell you that right now. They don't feel that they can trust the regime to maintain its word that they will have the safe passage to leave. And if they are stopped, they are prepared for a fight. So he's basically saying they'll blow themselves up because they don't trust the regime. This is before Aleppo f uh, was liberated in December. And Vanessa Bealey was in Aleppo. We documented it. Other people, RT, did as well. They, the, the regime were not shooting people coming out of East Aleppo. There was no genocide. Okay, this is all basically well-crafted propaganda on multiple media outlets, all coordinated as well, streamlined. So there's Clarissa in her costume. She speaks six languages, won all these journalism awards. Um, so she's been anointed by the establishment to be the keeper of the story in this case. But what is it really? I think it's more like that. CNN is a machine that churns out Pentagon and CIA information warfare daily. That's what they do. You just have to look at their product to make that assessment, because it's pretty obvious. And, in, and, in we, and we get, this is garbage pure garbage journalism. And this, this is what passes as infotainment or terrorism infotainment uh, by the mainstream media, the jihadi John narrative and so forth. That was all designed to get people in the right frame of mind to accept or to vote yes on a war, a bombing campaign against Syria. And so in the last days of Aleppo, I'll, some of you have probably seen this, but in the last days of Aleppo, they had all sorts of uh, things going on on the telly. Final messages are flying out of Aleppo, Syria. They're taking social media by storm simultaneously. It almost looks like a coordinated PR campaign. No place now to go. It's the last place. This may be my last video. This might be 
uh, close to, if not the last communication. It, uh, it's the last time that I talked to you. It's almost as if they were hoping these final messages would trend and get picked up by mainstream media. Bombs, bombs are everywhere. People are running. They don't know where, just running. We are here living a genocide, literally. People are executed. It's as simple as that. It's almost like these are just innocent civilians with no message, no strategy, no politics, just people simply fighting for their lives. One day, saying goodbye to the world on social media, the next day, giving interviews to BBC, CNN, and Al Jazeera, all in prime time. Well, they're not. These are activists. Some of them just recently joined Twitter and clearly support the revolution. They have thousands of followers. Some call themselves journalists and are verified on Facebook, like Bilal Abdul Karim, an American who has no problem pushing al Nusra propaganda. You know, the rebels. This guy is a member of the White Helmets, who were founded by a British ex-military officer and have been funded with millions by the US and UK. And then there's a little girl named Bana, also joined Twitter not so long ago, in September. She's already verified and has over 200,000 followers. Bana is seven years old and tweets in perfect English from the heart of East Aleppo with a little help from her mommy. She, of course, also had a final message just in time. So what do all of these people have in common? They want you to think there's one side to this story, one truth that Assad is randomly going from city to city and killing his own people for some crazy reason with the help of Russia, even though the whole world is watching every step. They want you to think that these civilians pouring out of Aleppo are running from genocide committed by the Syrian army, and those who celebrate on the streets are dancing on children's graves, while Al-Qaeda infiltrated rebels are bravely and heroically defending civilians in East Aleppo. The question is, do you buy it? Because millions of people do. The last clown of Aleppo. This could have been taken 10 years ago. They made a story. This was the last clown of Aleppo, and he died in a, in a Syrian or a Russian air. So it was the last doctor, the last clown, the last baker. It was just endless, OK? So this is real fake news. Women in, uh, women in East Aleppo chose suicide to avoid mass rape by the Syrian army, the Daily Beast. This also was uh, covered on CNN. And who wrote this story? That guy, former head of communication at the Henry Jackson Society in London. He's been advocating for this war for a very long time. So this is really dirty, OK? Just outright making stuff up. And do they get censored, the Daily Beast or CNN, as a fake news outlet by this new policing system? No. Think about the gravity of that. That's, and that's what pushed out casually. So this is, uh, I took this picture two weeks ago. That's an ISIS tank that had just been destroyed by the Syrian army, not just but a few weeks previous or uh, to that. There's a colonel from the Syrian army, Semir. So he kindly took us through an area that the public can't go. So they wanted some journalists to go and have a look and write some stories and cover this destruction of Palmyra. It's the Temple of Baal. ISIS did that. That's what it looked like before. That's what it looks like now. That can't be repaired 100%, so it will only be a partial reconstruction. This is the amphitheater. So I'll play you a little clip from inside. So in the amphitheater uh, here in Palmyra, and as you can see, there's uh, quite an extensive bit of damage here to the back facade of uh, the amphitheater, and uh, also some of the uh, set pieces um, on this foundation have been uh, destroyed as well. Uh, Bear in mind, this is you know thousands of years old, and uh, it only took uh, a few days uh, for ISIS to uh, inflict significant damage on this World Heritage Site. And uh, I might add also that uh, you know I might add also that um, ISIS, 2,500 fighters, hundreds of vehicles had a clear path 
uh, from Deir Ezzor right through the desert while the U.S. had eyes in the sky and uh, jets and uh, satellite reconnaissance, they could have stopped ISIS at any point, I think, if the mission generally was fighting ISIS, which the U.S. claimed they had entered Syrian airspace in the summer of 2014 on that basis, so it's hard to believe. So that's Palmyra. And yes, they could read the logo on my shirt with that satellite, I'm sure. So, so Homs, so we had a chance to witness, uh, Homs was just devastated. And this is where the real fighting began. These are the first people to really take up arms uh, and get organized. And it's just uh, beyond words to go through this neighborhood and also to hear the stories from the residents about what they did to the residents who didn't comply with the Sharia code or whatever they were doing. It was, it, it's not even worth repeating here. Um, we may, I may write about it at some point, but it's like, it's beyond the worst horror movie that you can imagine. It's even beyond Hollywood, if that's even possible. As sick, as sick and twisted as Hollywood is sometimes. So, so they, the, so the government, to stop the fighting, I think the al-Nusra is the dominant terrorist uh, group, which they still call rebels, some uh, Western politicians, media outlets. So they're getting beat and cornered in a lot of areas in Syria. So uh, the Syrian government and the Russians have guaranteed their safe passage to stop the fighting in exchange. They can leave with their arms to Idlib, which is in northern uh, northern Syria. It's like an, a little Islamic state that's being formed right now, but they're happier just to put them all over there, all their lunatics in one basket, and that people in these communities can go back to normal life, okay? So there they are coming in on green buses. This was about sunset. We came. There were no other Western journalists there. And R Russian security was there as well to guarantee uh, an extra layer, but they had their arms. Al Qaeda is armed. Okay. So these that's Jabhat al Nusra. That's al Nusra. It's the same as ISIS. It's just a slightly different flag, different uh, brochure. It's the same thing. Okay. So they're getting ready to go on coaches. Just them, their families, their kids, and belongings, and probably suitcases full of cash. I'm not sure. But uh, off to Idlib. That's uh, Al Nusra, armband. So these are not nice people. These are killers. And we spoke to residents in Homs. They're not nice people. So this is interesting here. Three generations, father, son, grandfather, all armed. And that young lad, it's probably about 16 or 17, and he's holding his weapon like a trained uh, special forces fighter. But anybody who's not in agreement with them is an infidel and therefore must die. And sometimes in the street, on the spot, or tortured, imprisoned, and then executed. So it's a particularly vicious brand of freedom and democracy if, this, if these are the moderate rebels. But it's sad because that, that poor, that boy was 10 years old when this war started. So he's a product of the war. That's the serious part of this that is not being covered in the media. So let's quickly just give you a little uh, power of media, okay, and babies. So this is the money shot. If you're a New York Times, Washington Post, so I took this. I probably could have sold it to Reuters or AP and made a couple thousand dollars. I don't know what, what they would pay. But anyway, that's the money shot. So what they don't show you is what happens right before that, which we have. I don't know if this was his baby or not, but someone from the Qatari Islamic charity in Idlib is handing him this baby, could be his baby. So he's getting the baby. Because they noticed there was a bunch of Western-looking people with cameras 
behind the buses, so the babies started arriving, <laughs> which was interesting. There he goes, he's getting it there, and there you go, there's the money shot, you see? That just as easily would be on the front of the Guardian with some headline, you know, whatever. But that's, the, in a nutshell, that's the, level, the light manipulation, but these are hardcore terrorists and more babies. All of a sudden, it was just babies are popping out of nowhere. <laughs> and he dumped that one 10 feet later. Peace sign as well. And kissing the babies. Baby chair. I mean, I, we laugh, but these are hardcore killers, right? But look how sensitive they are to Western media coverage. They think that we're, if we're CNN, we've got their back because CNN's had their back, the BBC's had their back for six years. So they, they see us, they're, wow, great. And they love the West, these guys. There's the governor of Homs. He went on the buses. I interviewed him afterwards. Vanessa also interviewed him. And he, he said people were in tears. They had to leave their home. That all of their generations are from their town and basically be deported. So as bad as it is, the yeah, other terrorists, they're whatever, but, you know, imagine it's, it's, it's going to be difficult for them uh, in their relocation process. And the kids, the wives, I'll never forget that look, a combination of anger and confusion, people covering themselves up to hide their identity. Um, you have to wonder what life's going to be like for all these kids born during this war. And what are their values going to be? What have they been taught? You know, how long is this revenge and cycle of revenge and hate going to go? Much of it imported from the Gulf. And the weapons from the US, from France, from, from the UK, from NATO member states, arming these guys. And then there's the white helmets. And they did win an Oscar. And we went to one of the, I went, visited three of their centers. And here's one in Hanano in East Aleppo. And they say, we're not political, we're not affiliated to any extremist groups. And uh, there's the Free Syrian Army flag, it's the French Mandate flag. And uh, inside, there's the, uh, you can see a little ISIS flag in there. We'll show you a little bit of that close up. There's a uniform. So they were planning, basically, this is the Free Syrian Police. This is this Free Syria Civil Service and the White Helmets. And they were, had these posters all over town. They were planning for the complete fall of the whole city of Aleppo and a total takeover by Turkey or Qatar or something like this. They were not, it wasn't just hit and run, vandalize and cause mayhem. They were building a shadow state, parallel structures to subsume or take over the real state, the real government structures in Syria. And this was all being called legitimate or civil defense by, West, by the West, by Boris Johnson, by the media. There is a real Syria civil defense, a fire brigade. Th this is not a civil defense. This is a Western creation, funded to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. Here's one of their videos inside, uh, or my video, of their, inside their center. This is more instructional videos from the White Helmets here for the children, uh, how to rescue. We've seen this uh, literature before. Huh, interesting. And then if we go above the instructional, the instructional rescue poster, what do we see? ISIS. The ISIS flag in the White Helmet Center. Daesh. Nusra. Daesh. Okay. Nusra, Daesh, interchangeable. It's, it, it, in term, these people, they don't distinguish between them. Not like our press that likes to divide all the groups up. Oh, this one's slightly moderate. This one's a bit extremist, but we're not sure. You know, they don't see. They, they're all terrorists to the average Syrian. Okay. So, here's another. This is in the basement. Al Nusra flag in their sleeping quarters. 
So that's a <clears throat> we're in the basement of the White Helmet Center. You just saw it now, Mr. Flag, on the wall. There's the White Helmets uniform there. I think they slept down here. So these were residence quarters and uh, full of uh, paraphernalia to protect, apparently, ga against gas or chemical attacks. So they must have known uh, <laughs> these chemical attacks were coming. But uh, reports suggest that so many reports uh, of al-Nusra uh, involved in chemical attacks. So no coincidence, the white helmets are prepared. There it is for yourself. The reason I, I was struggling to talk is it was, uh, wasn't very clean down there, the dust. So I'm in al-Nusra, Jabhat al-Nusra, al-Qaeda in Syria headquarters in East Aleppo, just 20 meters. Again, I have to repeat that, 20 meters from the White Helmets, the center. And uh, it's pretty clear how many schools they commandeered in East Aleppo, the terrorists. Uh, there was a reason for that, and uh, using schools, hospitals as human shields in whole communities, in fact. That was the strategy, and it was to sort of deter uh, any retaliation or to minimize targeting against them. These are terrorist groups internationally recognized by now. Incredible. This was interesting. Does that look familiar to anybody? You see those jam sandwich stripes? Look familiar? I went to the back of it's a few makeshift hospitals. Got a few ambulances here. I think this one might be supplied by the UK. I'm not sure. But this one's definitely Turkish there. So, again, this is right out the back of the White Helmet Center. Look at that. This ambulance looks familiar. Look at the red seat. You can see it looks like Omran, similar to the vehicle that Omran was, Dusty Boy of Aleppo was seated after that great photograph that spurred so much international outrage. It wasn't the same ambulance, but that image um, of Omran was uh, a seminal image that helped to galvanize public support again for uh, Western Gulf uh, coalition intervention and demonize Russia and demonize Syria. So a lot of people saw this picture. I remember when I saw it, I was taking a train from Plymouth to London and I was reading the Times. I saw that in the front. I'm all, this is a good one. This is a good one. Won all kinds of awards. Uh, the boy didn't cry and CNN said that's because he was in such shock he couldn't, he couldn't cry. And then she started crying. And, uh, but a lot of people didn't see that image. Most people haven't seen this image. That's, I think that's his sister. But notice the identical, they seem to be, have been done up exactly the same. And uh, no one, I heard a few rumors of where this boy is. And uh, suffice to say, when that story comes out, it's not gonna be good for all these media outlets. Um, especially if anyone finds out he was paid. I'll just leave it there. We'll see what happens. And a lot of people don't realize there was an extensive tunnel system under all these cities. In Damascus, you, if you're following this, you'll know about it. In East Aleppo, I'll show you one. This is Pierre. He's a French activist. He's on the ground delivering first aid kits on the front line basically to families, giving first aid training, giving uh, trauma counseling to schools, all on his own back. He's got his own little ch one-man charity that we support. Let's see if I can get... I'm not sure if I can get him or not. Here we go. Senior terrorism expert Michael Wise. It's funny because this group you're talking about for CNN, it is the same as Daesh, the same as Jabhat al-Nusra. This group are terrorist group here. 
I mean, there are pe there are people who were shooting on us every day, every day, every day, and there are people who were condemning people in the Islamic court for nothing sometimes, but just in the name of God. The CNN says that these were rebel. This was a rebel, the, the representative rebel council, no, the Levant Front. I ask, uh, sorry, but uh, the the Levant is a Islamic terrorist group. Yeah. They have nothing to see with rebel. If a rebel exists, because it, in Syria there is an opposition, like in any country. Yeah. But this group is like Jabhat al Nasr, like Daesh. There is no difference between them, and they are not the representant of anything here. Yeah. The biggest representant in the ground, the real representant, is Jabhat al Nasr. Mm -hmm. And Jabhat al Nasr, is... if you want to deal with Jabhat al Nasr to have testimonies, whatever you. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the same. They are like Levant. Yeah. They are the same, but just they are Islamic terrorist groups. They are killing the people. They bring the war. You see that? All this shit? Yeah. You see all this building? This building have been destroyed because the terrorists came here. They took this city, they took these places, and they shoot on the other side and they keep people on stage here. This building, this life, this life are destroyed because they came here to bring a war. Mm. Yes. And Pierre witnessed uh, in West Aleppo, uh, he tended to people dead on the street at least a few times from gas canister bombs that coincidentally or do exactly what the barrel bombs do that we're told in the media. Okay, in West Aleppo, they're randomly getting pelted for years with these uh, hell cannons. That's what he's talking about. So they brought the war. They occupied half of the city in 2012 and they brought the war and used the population as human shields. That's what all the evidence suggests. Here's a white helmet. And we've got dozens of these photos, by the way, up on our website, dozens. Different white helmets with Nusra or armed, okay? White helmets by day, terrorists by night. If it was once, okay, twice, fine, but 50? And that's just what we have. I'm sure there's more. So it's a total fraud. And our taxpayer money from the US, UK, France, countries like this, that's, that's what we're funding. It's fake. There's the breakdown till October 2016. Those are all publicly verifiable, undisclosed sums. We have no idea. Crowdfunding, crowdfunding this stuff. Okay? That's what's going on. You can crowdfund covert operations now. This is the, this is the world we live in. Okay? Now, uh, Vanessa put in a FOIA request for the European Civil Protection Humanitarian Aid Department and we're still waiting. I think they fobbed us off once. But anyway, how many millions in there? Could be a quarter of a billion dollars, could be half a billion dollars. Maybe a big chunk of it's going to a big PR company in London maybe to organize all the, synchronize all the media reports. Maybe. We don't know. And then this, is, this was for the crowdfunding, like seriously. Like there's any women even allowed near the White Helmet Center uh, or even, even on the street in East Aleppo unless they're completely covered. That's what was going on there. There's the real serious civil defense. Some of these guys can't even show their identity because they're afraid of becoming a target by Nusra. But some of these guys got killed as the White Helmets took over Aleppo, took over the fire stations, stole all the equipment, etc. Vanessa's reported that already. There's the, this is in the school. This is the uh, kiddies' lockers, which are now, you know, <laughs> AK-47, Kleshnikov, Dushka. It's an ammunition locker. And so, so that's a school. So when you see on the media, oh, they're targeting schools, the Russians, or the uh, Syrian Assad's targeting hospitals and schools. That's where an Al Nusra is. They occupied 300 school facilities in East Aleppo out of 500. And using it for that reason. And we talked to these kids too, very sad. Many of them haven't been to school in five years, six years. Or they're being taught maybe in the mosque. So who knows what they're being taught there. And they don't know what they want to be when they grow up anymore. That's, a, that's the sad truth. So it's, it's a big problem. 
going forward for Syria. Even, when, if, even if the war stops, they have a lot of stuff to deal with and a lot of psychological stuff too. Okay. This is uh, Al-Qaeda, Libya, I forgot what organization, basically saying that democracy is haram. Democracy is forbidden or it's evil, a product of the West. Those are the moderate rebels, the FSA, the Free Syrian Army. That's who your politicians are bigging up all the time, sending weapons to, giving political clout. Let me just show you some, one of the tunnels here. They talk about this, they, uh, they don't think about him, and they, but it's not finished because uh, I think uh, the war is finished and they go. They made a tunnel? Is that? This is uh, like, uh, uh, they, underground, yeah. Underground, yeah, uh, to make hospital in, in, in the ground. And connect with the main hospital. They make uh -huh. uh, they they. So all operations underground. On the ground, yeah, because Un they they want to uh, to keep uh, their uh, locations outside or uh, far away from the bombing from uh, the f uh, fire of Syrian army. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's a big that's it's a big, big tunnel. Yeah, but you see, it's about. Uh, 10, about 15 foot, I think. Uh, yeah, wide. 15, 15 uh, meters. So uh, you see, if you we, and this, uh, these are the uh, the car of ambulance. Mm -hmm. And then you see. Wow. So you could drive a car in the tunnel. Yeah. It's big enough. Wow. So they had tunnels between the buildings, between the main facilities. The main hospital, mm -hmm. Omar Abd Aziz, and there. Wow. It's amazing. And under everything underground. How many of you seen this on the mainstream media? Anybody? What we've got a billion dollar media machine in Europe. Where do they is this it's a good story, you think? It's decent. Worth knowing about, maybe getting some insight into the war. Okay. Here's one. This is in the this is in Jabat Al Nusra's uh, playground yard, which used to be a school next to the white helmets. About white helmets are behind this building, and so I think it was in Al Jazeera. One of the media uh, stories said that the Russians were targeting the white helmets, and so they they showed this crater, and of course I'm standing next to this crater here, and it's in Al Nusra's base, so to everything's lies and manipulation in terms of how they've covered this war. chemical attack a couple uh, weeks ago, beginning of April, that caused the U.S. to open, you know, cruise missile salvos on Syria and Idlib. And so here they are inspecting this chemical weapons attack. I mean, who, who buys this? Look at these guys. What is this? And if you know anything about chemical weapons, they kind of explode them in the air before impact, so it comes down, at least uh, in, the, in the real world. But, uh, so this passed for an investigation, good enough for The Guardian, good enough for our press. It's completely fabricated. And two countries blocked the independent investigation at the UN with the OPCW, the US and Britain. Blocked, and they don't want an independent investigation. They don't want a forensic investigation because they already got their story. They have their narrative, end of story and Assad's using chemical weapons against his own people. So there you go. So, Donald Trump, I know how to defeat radical Islam. This is yesterday. Does he really? So, there he is, bowing to the king of Saudi Arabia, the biggest state funder of radical, violent terrorism, one of the biggest on the planet. And there's Donald Trump, tough guy. So, uh, <laughs> so here's some of the, uh, this is one of the mothers of, when, in Graham Downing's presentation, he showed Vanessa reporting on UK column about the Russian Dean bombing. And this is one of the mothers who kept her kids in the bus because she thought something was dodgy, luckily. But she was crying by the end of that interview. And people were coming up to us, wanting to t talk to us. They were starved to tell their story. 
it was frantic, it was mental. And then we went to see some of the buses. Um, th these buses weren't in the immediate blast vicinity, but they were nearby, and all the windows were blown out. Spoke to the bus drivers. They didn't see any white helmets there. They saw basically a stage set up and people filming it. This was a giant snuff film. That's what it was. 126 people, kids, killed in a giant snuff film to be used in our media and to be used by the UN, to be used by the stakeholders in this war. And they lured them with, this is one of those chips that was in the bag. This was on the floor of the bus. It's a, a cheap little crisp because they starve these people for 48 hours in the bus waiting for a transfer to the point where they would get out and eat anything. And then they detonated this uh, truck. So you didn't see any of this on the 11 o'clock news, unfortunately. But if you did, it would, this war would not be happening. I'm telling you, it would not be happening. This is a factory in East Aleppo. They took out 1,500 factories in the first few months. Targeted textiles, pharmaceuticals. This was an economic rape. And all the machinery taken on the back of lorries, disassembled, packed with engineers from Turkey, sent to Turkey. This is, this is a coordinated operation. That's the story. John Snow. John Snow, that's the story. That's Farah Shahabi's factory, one of them. But this is what he's doing. He turned one of his factories into a school for poor kids. That's Ferris there. And uh, there, there, there are some great stories. They are rebuilding. It's, it's going to take a long time. It's going to be difficult, but they're doing it. And so behind me, this is Syria television. Those are all the journalists, and there's more. There's more out of the frame. I don't know how many in total, 50, 60, 70, I don't know. The Syrian journalists killed doing their job uh, 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 covering a war on their own homeland. OK, and you know what the average salary of these guys is? 150, $100 a month. Yeah, $100 a month, 150, maybe less, maybe a little more. Clarissa Ward's probably on 3.5 million a year to put out lies that's causing people to die. And these guys have, have given their lives serving their country as journalists, serving their communities. And, and, and you, they will not, you will never know their name. It's a crime, epic, epic crime. This is the big, they have done a number on this country that no one has ever seen before. 100 plus countries have ganged up to destroy one ancient civilization and the last secular Arab nation state in the region. They've done a number on this country like we've never seen before in modern times. And it's in and and, and a medieval fashion, the, the savagery and the barbarism of it all given political clout and cover by our governments, by our media. I blame the media especially. These people have been running with this narrative. I've even seen them go over here, see all these things that some of them I've seen, and they write this whole different story when they get home. Because it's good, it's good to be on 100 grand a year. It's good to be on 150 grand a year with a pension, I guess. But, who's pay but the Syrian people are paying they're paying for the pensions of all these rich Western journalists. They're paying in blood. That's a fact. Total lies from A to Z. There's hardly any bit of truth in any of the coverage over the last six years. I'm hard pressed to find anything. So this is my final day in Damascus. These are my final thoughts. So we're here in Damascus, uh, in Syria, and over the past few weeks, we've been able to talk to many people, and we've spoken to residents here, we've spoken to people from all over the country, people who live here, people who are from here, and uh, people who have 
stayed here, people who could have left but didn't leave uh, over the last six years of the crisis here in Syria. And our Western media, and these are my final thoughts on this subject, our Western media, the Gulf media, mainstream media over the past six years have chose not to speak to people from Syria who are here. Uh, they've spoken exclusively to what they call activists and people outside of the country and quote unquote rebels. This is what's happened over the last six years. They've given extremists political clout and because of this, because of all this, because of only airing that one extremist uh, and most extremist minority side of all events happening here in this country over the last six years, the media and politicians who echo their reports are responsible for dragging this conflict on for six years. We can pl place uh, quite a bit of blame at the feet of the media for this. Instead, they've erased the voices of millions of people who live here and not spoken to them, not gotten the truth. And we've spoken to many, many people here and uh, all across the country, and definitely their voices are not being heard uh, on Western mainstream media, and that's one of the biggest tragedies of the last six years. So that's what. The, so I'm just sharing with you what I learned. Okay, um, I'm just presenting you what I've found. You know what I learned uh, after a month in Syria was that everything that I thought happened was it validated all the things that I suspected. It just put a final stamp on it. But what it all, what it proved to me, and this was important, it proved that my research sources and methods were correct for the last six years. And the people that I work with uh, and the information we're getting and how we're processing it and presenting it was accurate. And so it does give me a little bit of confidence to say that we were right all this time. That we were right. That we, yes, we went out on a limb in, in, in relation to what everyone else was saying, but we weren't going out on a limb. We were just uh, following good sources and methods and good analysis. That's all. You know, we don't get paid millions of dollars to do that, but we're doing it. So it doesn't say a lot for those other organizations that they could get it so horribly wrong. Maybe intentionally so, who knows, or maybe not, but they're wrong either way. And uh, we, we, we did broadcast from Syria four shows, and <laughs> I had no interference at all from the Syrian government. They could have vetted our guests, they could have had someone sitting there, put, you know, could have put us in a studio and put the seven second delay button on. No, they just, I, they weren't even around. So go ahead. And we did. And, and I did the same show that I do, do in America and here in the UK. And we we're the first Western radio program to broadcast live from Syria. And we did it four weeks in a row. So that's a first. And we did it with ACR on the shoestring. <laughs> and, and this is a great event, uh, Stop the War Froom, good organization. We're doing a media trial in Froom uh, on June 11th, on a Sunday. And there's some flyers around, a few posters. I do encourage people. Uh, we've got Tim Hayward, professor from Edinburgh University, uh, Piers Robinson from Sheffield University, Vanessa Beely, myself, Robert Stewart, uh, are all going to be contributing to this. And uh, so that's happening. I encourage people to support Sheila Combs, head of this organization. She's doing a great job, working really hard. Uh, so it's going to be, I think, worthwhile, OK? And lastly, this is, this is how we survive. 
This is how we fund what we're doing. I don't get uh, any money from Putin or, uh, or Assad. Someone asked me, uh, you know, did the Syrian government pay for anything? We paid for everything. And let me tell you, it was not cheap. So that was an expensive uh, endeavor. We had a lot of listeners help us out, thank God, and helped us get there. But there was still, it was expensive. We didn't pay, we paid for everything, petrol. Uh, if we needed security, we paid for extra security. But sometimes we had the army. Uh, when you get close to a site, the army's there, so you have to go with them anyway. Uh, cars, drivers, hotels, food, everything, batteries. So we did it, and at a fraction of the price of what a, a bigger media outlet would do it. But we're, subscribe, check out 21wire.tv. Uh, just go to this 21wire.tv. If you want to support us, uh, subscribe monthly. Please um, do. We appreciate it. Any level of support, we totally appreciate. And it's going to allow us to take it to another level. I think we took it to another level this year. We're going to take it to another level next year and the year after. So we're in it for the long haul. And it's going to be hard work. But we need your help, uh, support to, to do that. Um, so we appreciate everybody. There's some subscribers and people in here that, that are also members. So I know who you are. And if, if, if I don't, Please come up and talk to me afterwards. But um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It sure is going to be really interesting to see where the media goes, because the lamestream are definitely going down the proverbial pan fast. And uh, it's going to be a very interesting few years. And Patrick, thanks for your contribution to uh, the alternative media, which has never been more important. And we're going to continue in this vein after lunch with um, Olsi Yazeksi, who's uh, come over from Albania. Now, Albania is not yet in the Syria situation, but uh, it's in the prelude to that. And if you, those of you who remember John Perkins' presentation way back in 2012, you know, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, and he showed the stages that the globalists go through to subjugate nation states and to pillage, pillage their resources. And Albania is in a situation today where the globalists are just starting to get their tentacles around the country. And who's involved? None other. And Tony Blair. So if you want to see how all this fits together, then uh, we're going to get back here, please, at uh, a quarter to two. Quarter to two this afternoon uh, for uh, Olsi Yazeksi. So have a great lunch, and we'll see you in a little over an hour.